And what we'd now like to do is uh, hear about the detail of health uh, from Ali Passa, uh, who joins us as founder and chief executive of Babylon Health. Ali, where are you? Good to see you. I hope you are hearing what Jim was saying about uh, where money is willing to go now. I was. How does that affect you and what you're seeing? And first of all, though, tell us your background. Um, I am a, a failed scientist. A I failed scientist. Failed scientist. I was a physicist uh, doing uh, uh, interaction of waves and currents in uh, University College London. I figured out I am a better entrepreneur, if you wish. And I was a physicist, so I became an entrepreneur, I built a business, I got lucky, it did incredibly well. I sold it, I became an investment banker, I was with a variety of banks, including Goldman Sachs. And after that, I decided to become an entrepreneur again and try and tackle one of the big problems of the world, which is healthcare. What is your direction of travel then? Pick up on what we just heard from Jim. So, let me take actually a step backward, if you don't mind, uh, Nick. Here's what we do. We spend $10 trillion a year on healthcare, and yet- You're talking about globally? Globally, all, all across, it's the largest sector in the global economy, and yet 50% of the world population has no access almost to any kind of healthcare. And, and of those who do, about 5 billion people have no access to surgery or hospital. So that $10 trillion actually goes to a min min minority of people in the world, in the same way almost that libraries used to be used by a small number of people in the world. And when it came Google, and it democratized information, it put it in the hands of every human being on Earth. And I think today, with the technology we have, it is possible to make healthcare accessible, affordable, and put it in the hands of every human being on Earth. To make healthcare accessible, all you need to do is almost deliver most of the healthcare most people need on the devices they already have. We do that in the United Kingdom, we do that in Rwanda, one of the poorest and one of the richest countries in the world, and, and we do it at great uh, scale and with huge success. The question, however, is there is no accessibility without affordability. And if you want to make healthcare so affordable that people in UK and Rwanda can afford, then you need to understand where the costs in healthcare are, and they sit in two buckets. Two thirds of all the money we spend in healthcare goes into salaries, doctors, nurses everywhere in the world are amongst the most expensive resource of that country and the rarest. And the second is in timing. Most diseases by the time they manifest their symptom, a $10 problem has become a $100 solution. So in reality, if you want to solve that problem, you need to put all your focus on how do I minimize what doctors and nurses do so they can do the most important things, and how do I see a disease before it shows its symptoms fully so that I can deal with well, it cheaply. This is fascinating. Help us understand where this is going. You say the equipment, the systems that they have. What do you mean, literally a mobile phone? Mobile phone. So tell, we, tell, tell me if, if I'm feeling rough. So if you well, how does a mobile phone uh, begin to detect or so you, diagnose. So you just saw earlier Will showing you a voice-activated uh, chatbot. Mm. Uh, you come to Babylon, you have a consultation with a chatbot who will tell you what is probably wrong with you. Uh, it will then pass, it says that, Nick, you need to see a doctor. Many people in UK do that. Uh, then we connect you immediately to a doctor on your mobile phone. We do that for a third of the population of Rwanda, for instance, without even a smartphone. They just talk to uh, a doctor on a normal but why does it have phone. to be a human being anymore, the doctor? Because the challenge is there's no regulatory environment in the world yet that would allow a machine to diagnose you and prescribe you on one hand, and two, in spite of all the hype you hear about artificial intelligence, it is still at its infancy. So the idea that we can still trust the machine to do, to say that, look, you need to take antibiotics, and here is a course of antibiotics for you, they're a little bit further uh, than that. We just did a test about a year ago with, uh, 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 Stanford University and Yale Medical School, where we showed that in primary care, our AI is as accurate as human doctors, but that was in primary care. When it comes to specialty care, cancers or orthopedics, that's a huge field, and one needs to build patiently, but consistently. One doesn't need to get overhype a technology that is not there yet, 
but continue building it. Look, in your industry, your previous industry, in media, in 1997, Reed Hastings called his company Netflix, flexibly available on the internet. It took until 2012 before they could stream anything. In 97, it would have taken four months to download a, an episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> Today, uh, you can do it in seconds. And that's the world we're moving on. You always build for where the world is going rather than where it is today. But it is premature today to expect artificial intelligence to do some of the fantasies we read um, advocated by some. What about the business of care? And you mentioned it yourself, Absolutely. the cost of personnel, the cost of real estate, the cost of equipment, uh, particularly with some of the repetitive sides of, of, of health care. Um, particularly dementia, aging, and so on. Can you imagine that much of what is going on at the moment, including those who are bedridden, could be and turned by machines? Uh, we've seen what's going on outside with cleaning the, cleaning the street with, um, with, with, with a, an automated machine, which is going up and down. Are we moving into that kind of area where much of what healthcare is about, which is about the human being, the person who costs a lot of money, that is going to be replaced? So I think increasingly we can replace more and more of what human beings do. So we are starting with the computational medicine. aspect in medicine. So we can show a picture and say whether this is a broken bone or not, for instance, very simple stuff. Then we are moving to what the kind of stuff we do, which is can tell you what possible diseases you have based on your diagnosis. But we will send that back to a doctor to confirm with you. But Nick, there is a part of this as a human uh, aspect in this. Uh, a machine cannot today put its hand on your shoulder and say, Nick, trust me, I'm going to get you and your family through these hard times. There is a part that the machine does, and machines happen to be incredibly good, for instance, at probabilistic graphical modeling, as computational modeling, at deep learning nowadays, at understanding data. But there are parts human do, which is the interaction with you. But it's this combination of machine and man and woman that will make healthcare for the foreseeable future a much more accessible, a much more affordable solution that we have today. But you're talking, understandably, about half the world for whom this is a real luxury at the moment, yet they deserve equal treatment uh, when it comes to the potential and what healthcare, what healthcare can operate, uh, offer them. What, what about the, wh where this is going and how quickly this is going to happen? This is not just dreaming. This is about where the technology is al and the science is already taking us. Absolutely. It's not dreaming at all, Nick. If I told you, you're from Britain, if I told you that with the same money that GPs get in Britain in order to deliver health care for eight to nine hours a day, five days a week, uh, we can deliver health care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we can do so not with two weeks or one week of waiting, but within a few minutes of you waiting. But first through AI, but also through a doctor face to face. And when necessary, send you to see one somebody. You would have thought, as many did, only a year ago, two years ago, that's impossible. Today we are delivering it in UK. We are also delivering it to one third of the population of Rwanda. We're delivering it in Canada. We're delivering it in Southeast Asia. So what only two years ago seemed an impossibility, it's happening today. The, if you live in Rwanda, in one of the most remote areas of the country, you pick up your phone, you dial 886, you talk to a doctor within minutes. That is not available in most countries in the world. And one of the poorest have demonstrated you could do that. One of the don't, don't the, doesn't the prescription get delivered by drone as well? In Rwanda, they, no, they don't deliver prescriptions yet in drone. They have a program that delivers blood in drone. Uh, but again, it shows what can be done. There is no reason. There is no reason today for any country where your child is sick, that you need to take them out of their bed, that they need to wait a few days to go see a doctor or even a few hours to go see a doctor, uh, go wait in a waiting room while they're feeling awful to see a doctor most of the times. Nine out of ten times, we can deal with them at the comfort of their own home, deliver their drugs to them within the hour. And that is what is possible today. So even if the science can be addressed by AI, that human touch of the reassurance when you're feeling rough and you're feeling dreadful, that human assurance, you described it as the tap on the shoulder or the reassurance, that's going to be more difficult to replace. For some, 
for the generation of my children, actually they can do without. So my children much prefer the AI in Babylon to find out what it is that they got. And when they have to talk to a doctor, they dread it. But for my generation, maybe I need the uh, uh, reassurance of the doctor. And for my father and mother generation, they actually will do away with the AI and want to talk to a human. That is why, Nick, this one solution fit all does not work. Humans are very different in their pre preferences. And for those who run health systems in the world, do never think about the hippest, the youngest, but think about all humanity in its beautiful colors and try to make it accessible and affordable for every human being on earth, not just for a few privileged ones. Ali Pasa, thanks for very much opening our horizons to what is really coming and quickly. Thank you, Nick. Great having you. Thank you very much indeed.